We'll call to order the uh, planning committee meeting of uh, Tuesday, June 7th. And uh, a, a, before we have it, I'd like to add a number, uh, we'll call it 4B, and that's purchase of land. And a, a document will be handed out in a few minutes here. Okay, with that, uh, motion on the minutes. Seconded. All those in favor of contrary carry. Next meeting, June 21st. And as always, okay, the first item on the agenda is the application by DC Limited, Ding General uh, Construction Limited for rezoning at 9231 Kilby Street from single detached RS1E zone to the single detached RS2A zone. And we have Mr. Craig and Mr. Andrews to introduce it. And Thank you, we have a resolution Mr. on the back. Carol? Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, carry on, Mr. Andrews. I saw Councillor Day's hand before you even approached it, so I um, are you okay? You're okay? Yeah. Oh, okay, she's okay. All right, thank you. Nathan, you're on. Sorry for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have nothing further to add aside from highlighting that the rezoning is to facilitate the subdivision of one single detached lot into two single detached lots, which complies with the lot size policy for the area. A $20,000 tree survival security will be provided for the retention of two trees and the landscape security to ensure that a total of two new trees are planted and maintained on lot B. Both lots will provide a minimum one bedroom secondary suite that meet the zoning bylaw requirements and vehicle access will be from the rear lane. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, Councillor Day's had her hand up for her last uh, speech, so you're on. Carol? Um, Staff, um, so Kilby Street isn't a particularly arterial road, but it is in an area of, of densification. So I can't help but notice that item one and item two are right beside each other. Was there any option of uh, combining 9231 and 9271, which happens to be the same developer, into a larger lot and creating maybe more affordable, like um, smaller suites or, or something that would be, you know, attract um, people with a lower income? Mr. Chair, to Councillor Day, uh, the application is actually by two different companies while they do share a similar last name. Uh, in terms of review of the applications, uh, they were reviewed in the context of the existing OCP policy and the lot size policy, which does call for uh, compact lot single family development with rear lane access. These are the only two remaining lots on the north side of Kilby uh, to be re redeveloped in this local. Okay. Well, my apologies for thinking it was the same company. The names are very similar. <laughs> um, but okay, so it's just not an option to put them together and create a, a more denser option there. We couldn't make an OCP amendment. Yes, uh, through the chair to Councillor Day, uh, again, we reviewed these applications in the context of the existing OCP and the lot size policy. They were submitted as two separate single applications. I'd like to see what happens at public hearings. So I'll support it for now. Okay. Any further discussion? Motion to approve. Move seconded. All those in favor of contrary carry. Okay. The next one is an application by Parm Jingdolf for the rezoning at 9271 Kelby Street from single detached RS1E zone to the single detached RS2A zone. And again, Mr. Craig and uh, Mr. Andrews. This time, Mr. Andrews, you're on. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this rezoning is similar, is uh, one single detached lot into two single detached lots, which complies with the lot size policy for the area. A uh, $3,000 landscape security is required to ensure two replacement trees are planted maintained on each lot for a total of four trees. Both lots will provide a minimum bedroom, one bedroom secondary suite that meets the bylaw requirement and vehicle access is again from the rear lane. Okay. Any questions of staff? I think it was cleared up in the last one. Motion? Oh, I have a question. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Question to staff. Um, it, 
it looks like these two parties are probably working possibly together. Um, is it possible that their um, permitting sort of goes around the same time so that, you know, if there's going to be demolition at all, kind of happens on the same day or two days kind of thing, so that it's not constantly, you know, here's a demolition, five months later, there's a, you know what I mean? Like if we can, if it could be paced together, it would probably be less impact on the neighborhood than if there's one goes, it's six months ahead of the other one, and then it just, it stays construction forever. Uh, through the chair to council, we're happy to have that conversation with the applicants to see if there is an opportunity for that uh, coordination. Uh, I believe both applicants are in the meeting and may be able to provide further information on their and They're here and they're nodding, so okay. they're... they're uh, and not to slow them down, but certainly to like keep everything up. moving together at the same pace, because I think it it would be easier on the neighborhood. Excellent points. Okay, any further discussion? All right, motion mo moved, seconded. All those in favor, contrary, carried. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to public hearing a month from now. So uh, the next item is our farm uh, first strategy and our staff recommendation is being to be received for information. Mr. Hopkins, are you gonna walk us through this? What your document, uh, thank uh, you for it. And I'm sure there'll be some questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we actually have nothing further to add uh, to the report, uh, but staff are here to answer any questions. Okay, how, how do we, if I may, I didn't see anybody with their hand up. Uh, Harold, and, uh, all right, Harold, I'll go to you first. You're muted, just push the button. Yeah. No. No, not, not yet, Harold. We okay. Try again. There we are. Sorry about contact. that. Yeah. <laughs> Houston, there yeah, is forgot, contact. I forgot. Okay. I forgot to throw out my mic. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment on page 80. Uh, it mentions um, uh, raising the farmland as, as a report, and there's one of the referrals. And I'd just like to mention that last night we added a further referral that if we're dredging the Stevenson Harbor and Scotch Pond, for example, there's class one agricultural soil that's, that's uh, dropped in those two harbors. And if we were able to have, a, have a, a city dredge, and there was a dredge in the harbor at one time that dredged both Scotch Pond and the harbor, it was just a barge with a, uh, with a suction dredge on it. And uh, you can actually st stockpile the soil and use it for raising, for, for raising the land. So. Uh, you might want to add that referral there because that's what the idea was. That uh, it's it's a long-term project. We'd have to find some place to be able to store the soil and and, and stabilize it. But uh, it would it, it should be pretty good. They, at, at at Scotch Pond, they said it was Class One agricultural soil, and I think the harbor is the same. Okay. That's the only addition. Uh, it's an excellent report, and I'm glad to see uh, it, it it moving along quite smoothly. Okay, thank you, Harold. All right, Carol. Staff, so I see that we've written a letter uh, to the Minister of Agriculture, and we've also coordinated with the Minister of, of Agriculture and the ALC on major policies. Is there any other cities that are doing a farming first strategy, and have they made any suggestions of how we could make it better? Through the Chair to Councillor Day, I'll actually pass that question over to Mr. D'Souza. To the chair, to Councillor Day. Um, yes, other municipalities uh, have similar uh, farming first strategy or agricultural viability um, strategies uh, in process or completed. Um, when we developed the farming first strategy, um, an environmental scan was completed to review these uh, plans uh, and incorporate uh, some of the strategies and methods that were being utilized in other municipalities. Okay, good. Thank you. Good. All right, Andy. Thanks, and, and through the chair, <clears throat> well, thanks for the report, uh, very comprehensive. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, can you offer any comment on the uh, amount of farmland currently actually being farmed in Richmond versus the, I think, 39% of land that is ALR? And um, what I'm looking at is, is there any trend that's apparent yet to you in terms of more land actually being farmed? I've heard different numbers. 
the two of the chair to Councillor Hobbs. That once again, I'll pass that over to Mr. D'Souza, who I believe has some recent stats on on that information. To the chair to Councillor Hobbs, uh, the both the amount of land in the ALR and amount farmed has remained relatively stable. Um, we haven't seen any significant increases or decreases in those numbers. Okay, and just a couple more questions, uh, if I may. <clears throat> and so, the amount of land being farmed is one thing. Uh, is there any comment that you can provide on the uh, productivity of the land being farmed or the metrics that we use to measure um, the productivity of the land uh, that is being farmed? Through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, uh, one of the metrics that's utilized uh, through the Census of Agriculture is the uh, total um, operating re revenue of farms. Uh, and this has steadily increased over the years. Um, based on the latest census of agriculture. Well, sure, thanks for that. And revenue is an interesting indicator, you know, in terms of productivity, but um, it'd be interesting to dig down a little bit deeper in terms of what we're actually producing and the productivity levels, because prices can be a different thing. But anyway, my last question is just, um, does this dovetail, because um, it's the first time I've seen this report, so does it dovetail with the, I think it was the Premier's Task Force on on agriculture, that might not be the exact title, but it's about an 80 page document that had a number of um, strategies in it and initiatives. And does this dovetail quite nicely with that one? Because I haven't read them side by side. I've now looked at them separately, 12 months apart. But through the chair to Councillor Hobbs, uh, yes, in many ways it does dovetail into the provincial work that was done. There was a, a significant uh, review of the ALC and, and ALR and uh, a, a lot of what came out of that has been applied to the Farming First strategy, which was adopted just a little over a year ago. So it incorporates a lot of that work and a lot of the um, uh, work that was done locally on, um, you know, dealing with uh, the size of residential buildings, uh, but also a number of other uh, issues that related to farming uh, that, has, you know, greenhouses and uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, related um, pressures on a uh, ALR land uh, is all reflected mm -hmm. within this uh, Farming First strategy. Yeah, thank you. And this was a good report. And the Premier's report was very good, too. So I'll have another look at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair? Yes, actually, I've seen the question, but I just want to ask uh, from another, another perspective. Well, since the adoption of our strategy uh, a year ago, uh, did staff see anything coming from the provincial government that might be contradictory to what we are doing or that might threaten uh, our strategy in, in its in implementation? That comes from the from the provincial government or the AL Commission. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Ao, um, off the bat, no, not really. Uh, there is some concerns with some of the agritech uh, legislation that has come out, but there is certainly not a, a a threat with respect to the way our bylaws are written and the way they're presented. So, um, so there's really nothing open there that uh, could be of uh, immediate concern. So uh, right now, uh, there's nothing that's contradictory to uh, provincial legislation. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair, just uh, three short questions here. Um, one kind of relates to Jack, uh, Councillor Al's question there. Um, since the, uh, the provincial government uh, made the announcement about allowing secondary houses on uh, ALR properties, um, I, I know we, I, I don't recall hearing any. I don't know if they have to come to council or do they just go for buildings approval, but could you comment on um, the, the development of secondary houses on, on ALR properties? Through the chair to Councillor Wolf, uh, what I can say about uh, that legislative change is that there's some changes on the provincial side that allows municipalities to make a, a to say yay or nay on on a particular policy. So secondary dwellings is one of them, where our policies state only one dwelling per lot, essentially on the agricultural land, uh, and we have the uh, ability to um, to maintain that policy. Uh, and that's the same with Agritech. We have the ability to say yes or no to Agritech uh, uh, with, with that new legislation. So secondary dwellings, uh, just maybe to add a little bit to that, they used to be permitted a number of years ago. We have a handful of them throughout uh, the city, uh, but they are now considered uh, legal but non-conforming. And uh, we haven't had a new application for secondary dwelling for some time. And we currently don't, per per or we don't allow it now. 
Uh, thanks uh, so to the chair. Just to follow up on that, then. So, if one an application did come through, would it be coming to council to make the consideration? Through the chair to council, well, yes, it would. It would come to council for consideration first. Uh, and like I say, there is uh, guidelines with, or regulations within the provincial side of things, but it would come to council first before um, any anything was considered to go to the ALC. Ter terrific, thank you. Um, the second question uh, through the chair of staff. Um, I, living out in East Richmond, I see a lot of uh, cranberry uh, farmers um, kind of scrape the top of the field off every year and pile it aside. Um, and then we, we hear about needing to raise the land, but there's all this lowering of the land that seems to happen every year as a result of this practice do do we know like how long do those giant mountains of cranberry debris take and then do they plan to spread them back over the land because um, what, what i see a lot of them doing is killing the trees and the and the row of hedges and stuff at the edge of the property because they're smothered in edge in, in these piles that are composting through the chair to council wolf i'm not uh, 100 familiar with that practice i don't know if mr d'souza is able to add any light to that or or we do have other staff here on this uh, meeting that may be able to respond to this but uh, uh, Stephen, anything to, to add to that question um through the chair to council wolf my understanding is that is a standard practice in cranberry operations uh stockpiling material i believe they they do then utilize that material at some point through the harvesting process um, but that is a, a standard practice for a cranberry operation. Okay, thanks. Uh, just to follow up then, uh, for three years, all I've seen is those piles growing. I haven't seen anything come off of them yet, um, but they're, they're sorted well. You can see some that are more berries, some that are more branches, and some that are more roots, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, and my final question, if I may, through the chair, I was just looking into next week's uh, community safety meeting agenda, and I saw that there's 27 properties that are non-compliant, uh, with either unauthorized fill, soil deposits, or removal. Um, is that within what the Farming First strategy finds acceptable? Um, are, are, I know when I've asked that community safety, are there trends or things that staff have noticed in these non-compliant uh, properties? Um, but often the answer is no, there are no trends. Um, but overall, uh, for this whole year, have we, have we noticed any trends in non-compliance? Uh, through the chair to council, Wolf, I, I may defer that to Mr. D'Souza as well, but I'm not sure if you uh, have that information handy or not. Um, no. Okay. It, it's something we'll have to look into to see if there's any trends. I can't say with soil fill applications or, or non-compliant ones. Um, my sense is that it, that actually has declined, that there has been increased enforcement. Uh, but once again, I, I will need to confirm those uh, th that data. Great. I'll be asking that question at Community Safety next week. Yeah. So thanks so much. Okay, Harold, and then I'm going to make a couple comments, wrap it up. Yeah, just one further comment, uh, partly in answer to Michael's question. Uh, Metro Vancouver has been having a lot of meetings with the cranberry growers about the debris that they pile up and, and, and in opposition to them burning it. And so one reason that the uh, material is there decaying uh, is because uh, of the of the burning ban that, that Metro is trying to impose because of the, uh, the smoke and uh, smoke pollution. So I think it should be something staff might want to look at to add uh, somewhere along in, in, in our studies that uh, cranberry fields uh, do have a lot of debris. Uh, it needs to be uh, um, dealt with in some way, and it may be uh, it, it simply used as compost, but, uh, but burning is a bit of a problem as, as far as Metro Vancouver is concerned. Okay, okay thanks, Harold. Um, and just a, a, c a couple of comments to staff, if I may, and follow up. Um, a good report, excellent report. I'm assuming that this uh, uh, replaces the agricultural strategy that we had and we've had going on for the last 20 years. Um, uh, although I don't think we should forget it because some very important work that was taking place in there. But I would follow up in terms of um, uh, Councillor Hobbs commenting in, in looking at does this strategy, and I know it's only a year, but will it increase farming and will increase agriculture within the community of Richmond. And I think metrics are extremely important. And uh, I wanna emphasize one in terms of productivity uh, and volume, and where does the product go? Is it exported? Is it um, made into wine? And where is it, does it get to the local market? I think it's something our economic development 
officers uh, should be taking metrics of. We should have that kind of data um, on it. And also for food security, um, I think the scope of the product, what is being planted. You know, one time we had the best um, uh, peas, uh, um, I guess we'll call it 100 acres, and uh, we supplied the whole, uh, whole province with peas at one side. And we had other crops, with, and that was on Sea Island, as a matter of fact. Uh, we had other crops. So what crops are being uh, um, grown and uh, what is there for lo from the local point of view? I think it's important uh, that we, uh, we continue to do that. And we obviously we'll review this again in another year. But the implementation and the impact are extremely important of this. The, the question I had, and I think uh, one of the councillors mentioned, who are we sharing this with? Is this going back to the farming community? Are we going to get a chance to share it to our various committees? like our food security group or lag committee, many of the councillors are on it, uh, to uh, let them have copies thereof. And, and hopefully we we'll discuss at their meetings and put it on their agendas, not just receive it for information and put it in a binder. Read it. John, uh, to comment? the chair, yes. So th this will be shared uh, with the uh, Food Security and Agriculture Advisory Committee, but we can certainly take direction from committee if you'd like it shared with uh, other stakeholders or uh, our groups. Well, I think it should be shared to as many people as possible, let, let people know what's going on, um, and especially our own um, committees. Okay, we have a recommendation to receive for information. Motion seconded. All those in favor? Contrary carried. Thank you very much for a comprehensive report. Okay, the, we've got the next item is rental. Uh, we received uh, a, a, a rental housing document. Uh, John, do you want to say anything that before we put the other resolution on the floor? Uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. And then I, I'm going to go. Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go to staff, and then I'm going to go to delegations. Okay, John, do you want to say anything about that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yeah, pretend pretend to be John for a minute. Um, we did take the liberty we did take the liberty of circulating a staff memo. Yes. Um, basically what we're saying is that with this sort of a, a policy, um, we have a couple of types of property where it would be possible to do uh, uh, rental development. Um, we have about 23, at the time of the memo we didn't have the numbers so we didn't include them, but we have about 23 commercial properties that are designated uh, commercial. So they would be uh, potential sites and, and they're distributed throughout the city, outside the city centre. Um, they would be potential sites where this could apply. We also have eight uh, properties. They tend to be the neighbourhood shopping complexes, the shopping centres that designated neighbourhood service commercial and again, uh, they and Broadmoor is an example where a couple of years, a few years ago, actually, we we did redevelop a portion of that site, which is a series of separate lots um, for rental housing. So, in all, there would be outside of the city centre of uh, 31 properties where this would be uh, applicable. Um, within the city centre, it does get a little trickier. Um, we've got a number of things going on. Uh, for one, some of the commercial properties also uh, they're in what we call the red zone and, and therefore they have uh, aeronautical zoning restrictions that preclude us from uh, building residential uh, on those sites. Um, so, uh, and, and we also have some properties that are already zoned or designated for mixed use. And so they, they already have an entitlement to build a market uh, residential, condominium residential. And so those, those properties we think are, are a little bit more complex and it might take a little bit more thought to figure out how to get more rental onto those. One approach, and we're going to bring you uh, the SPIRES referral at the next committee meeting, but one approach for those uh, those city centre properties that already have residential potential uh, could be to apply the same approach that we'll be bringing you in the Spires Gate area, which is to allow basically extra new 
residential density, but target all of that extra density uh, as rental, both market and below market. So um, in a nutshell, uh, this would be applicable outside city centre to a little bit over 30 properties. And within the city centre, we would frankly need a little bit more time after the discussion today at committee to figure out how we might apply it because the landscape's a little bit more complex there. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, we have two delegations to address uh, this topic. Uh, Mr. Ralston, uh, Ralston, you're first. And then uh, I got D in front of me. Can we connect, Mr. Ralston, Thanks please? very much, uh, Councillor McNulty. And yeah, welcome. Um, Always nice to see you. Good to see you, too. Uh, too many people named John here, I guess. We'll have to go yeah. by nicknames. Um, to have our written submission uh, expressing strong support for this motion. So, while we would like to see a lot done about enabling 100% rental over commercial throughout the city, uh, as has been said, it's easier to do in some places than others. However, I think we disagree in terms of where it's easier and where it's more difficult. Our feeling is, is that there actually are areas in the city centre where it would be quite easy to do it. And those are ones where it doesn't require an OCP amendment. And it can be done by amending two zoning definitions, as has been done in Vancouver. So that way, any property that doesn't need an OCP amendment and has one of those two zonings would thereafter not have to apply for rezoning in order to add rental. So it's just a matter of adding a, a, a rental housing use to two existing uh, zoning definitions. And in terms of this whole thing about the red zones and, and the flight paths, we're talking about properties that fall in between the two flight paths and uh, south of them. So there's a huge amount of uh, potential single-story commercial that could have rental above it in the city centre simply by altering these, these two uh, zoning definitions. So as has been said, uh, there are a lot of mixed-use and downtown mixed-use uh, OCP definitions which allow for both commercial and residential. So in terms of the zoning side of it, um, we are looking at, at the CA, which is auto-oriented commercial zone, and the IR, which is industrial retail zones. And there are a lot of those that are not in the flight path. Uh, they have OCP uh, mixed use and downtown mixed use designations in the OCP. So uh, there's really no obstacle uh, to, to allowing rental housing in, in uh, those particular cases. And it's simply a matter of adding a maximum height. The current maximum height is 45 meters in the CA zone and 35 meters in the IR zone. And those heights are sufficient to make 100% rental very profitable. And of course, as has been said, the existing density bonuses for rental units would be included. And we want to make the point that we should not be simply permitting any type of residential use in those zones and over these single story commercial properties. What will immediately happen is you're going to get strata condos. So if you're looking for 100% rental, the only way to be sure you're going to get it is by only permitting 100% rental over these uh, commercial properties. And that is actually in, uh, specified in Councillor Day's uh, motion. And uh, the other thing we, of course, we, we discussed last time the Vancouver requirement that if rental housing is added, commercial must be maintained on the ground level. And the fact that in CA zoning, that would also mean that uh, anybody who's doing auto repair and painting, if they want, which is incompatible with residential housing, 
if if they want to add rental housing, they would have to move uh, those particular activities elsewhere. So we actually think that it's a little bit more difficult uh, outside the city centre because although all these neighbourhood shopping centres are defined as neighbourhood service centre, which includes residential in the OCP, um, converting this, this community commercial uh, zoning into would require additional height. So I know my time is running out, but the point we'd like to make is that people in the neighborhoods might want to be consulted on what the maximum height ought to be if you're adding rental um, above the various shopping centers outside uh, the city center. Thanks okay. very much. Thank you, uh, John. Now I have a question from Councillor Day. And, um... Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rustin. So just through the chair, um, so you basically said that there's uh, quite a few properties in the downtown core that lie in between the two, the flight paths that are, right? And um, any idea how many? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. Sorry. And, um, but the, but when you combine when you com combine the two types of zoning, both the CA zoning, so there's there's a huge amount of CA zoning, all kinds of things. Which actually, it's it's sort of a misnomer to call it auto auto oriented because if if you look at the city center in between the flight paths and south of them. Um, a lot of things that have the CA zoning actually don't have have very little in the way of a lot or anything in them. Yeah, it, it, I know exactly what you're talking about. I used to do uh, repairs in those shops to vehicles for what I do is to have my sign business, and they're all gone. It's just very few left. Yeah. So my other question was about height. You said that um, we might need a little more height in order to make it. Um, you've got it in your memo here. Um, that some of them, the heights are sufficient, but what do, height do you think is is required so that, like that you said, maximum uh, nine meters would have to be increased. What do you see that being increased to? So uh, the two zonings in the city center are 45 meters. Yeah. And I, you know, staff will know better, but it's probably, you know, 12 stories or something like that. And, um, 35 meters, which is, I guess, around nine stories. I would think that probably in in the in the neighborhood, so outside the city center, all these various shopping centers, where right now the maximum height is nine meters, I think ideally it would be sort of increased to about 35 meters. You know, I think you know most people start getting uncomfortable if it's if it's you have this huge high rise smack dab in the middle of a residential area. But at 35 meters, you know, you're getting eight, nine stories. So that would be great. All right. That's just like um, basically the gardens at Stevenson and number five road. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Hey, Alexa. Oh, that was my question for staff. Oh, go ahead. Um, okay, John. Um, thank you very much, John. Appreciate it. Oh, sorry. And we still have a deep. Uh, okay. Let, well, um, I'm going to then now ask, um, D. Whalen to come forward, but you can ask your staff your question now. Oh, okay. Um, All right, a question sure. to staff, and D, come on forward. Sure, just a um, question to staff, just a clarification. Um, Auto-oriented commercial, it means you drive there, park, and do your business. It doesn't mean it's centered around the business of servicing and selling and whatever automobiles. Is that correct? Staff? Uh, through the chair to councillor, uh, that's correct. It's it's a wide range of commercial uses that are sort of auto friendly, uh, as you will. So it's not just auto, auto body shops, in, but it allows hotels. That you drive there, right? No. Correct. Okay. Correct. It's a staff. Yes. Okay. Go ahead quickly, and now I want yes, the delegation quick, to have. Yeah, it's a quick question. I want to ask, ask staff how easy it is to revise the definition uh, on the on the on the use. Is it uh, just by making a change on council, or do we have to go through a process of uh, almost like a rezoning process? Through the chair to Councillor Ao, yes, it would be a, a rezoning process, which would require a public hearing. Uh, it, 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 and as uh, Mr. Ersig said earlier too, I think with the city centre, it's quite complex because of the policy framework that uh, those zones are under that do allow residential. So it would require a, a, a bit of research, but in the end, I think to make that work, it would require a, a bylaw amendment that's adopted by council. Okay. 
All right, thank you. Dee, thank you very much for your patience. Welcome. Thank you, uh, Dee Whalen. I'm, I'm just here as a, as a citizen. I, uh, I used to be a negotiator, and uh, when I look at this recommendation, it's very simple, and uh, I like that. Uh, the more words you have, the more uh, convolutions and uh, difficulties you have with it. Now, I didn't look at all of the, um, the ins and outs and uh, all of the zoning um, needs that uh, my friend John Rostin has. Um, however, I did read the staff report that John Hopkins did, and uh, I, I, I'm pleased uh, with what they have done so far. And uh, it's, it's looking as if this is something that's doable, and it could be doable right now. I was also looking at um, um, the um, the housing needs report from 2021, where, which said that uh, in the last 30 years, 94% uh, of the new builds in Richmond have been condos, and only 6% have been rentals. And uh, when I look at the, uh, the folks that I volunteer with um, in uh, my social justice uh, work, um, there is an, a, a dire need for, for more rentals, and I would say affordable rentals. Um, you have your own definition for that. But uh, if we can get uh, at least get some more rental supply, that would be that would be good. Um, and 100% um, uh, um, uh, residential units. I was looking actually at more like um, uh, like the mosaic um, development that's going in now at uh, three and um, and Williams and and it's uh, it's gentle density. It's a way on on busy corners that you can have the amenities that uh, people need, places that they can walk to, and a, f a few floors above. Now, John Rostin is talking about uh, when we get into city center, there's lots more high rises there. I would think that would be step two of um, uh, city staff taking another look at that. But if there's a way that um, some of these uh, corners, like the 7-Elevens, and uh, we're losing a lot of gas stations, there doesn't seem to be as much need for gas stations anymore, and that's what Mosaic is built on. And I understand it has to be remediated and all of that, but I think there's a lot of potential there in, in uh, these corners. And what I mean by gentle density is a few floors, not to build huge towers on, on the corners that would create like wind tunnels in, in uh, the city. So that's, that's just kind of my, my feeling of, of the whole thing. I think this is a, it's a good resolution or a good recommendation. And uh, finally, I would say take a look at, uh, at uh, creating a residential, a, uh, tenancy, sorry, um, uh, uh, rental tenure zoning uh, on these. And you don't have to create a whole neighborhood. You can do it lot by lot by lot. And it's a way to start to make those changes that, that I think that, that uh, the city needs. So that's, that's all I had to, uh, to well, say. Thank Thanks for much. letting me speak. All right, we have a question from the council today. Thank you very much for coming forward. So when I wrote this motion, I didn't think it was going to be the silver bullet that was going to solve all of our rental okay. problems. But um, And I'm glad that you pointed out, as I had put the pictures in, of the number three and Williams um, uh, complex, which I'm thinking has about 40, 45 units in it. If, if 33. 33, okay, thanks for that. <laughs> I was counting the windows. We spoke on that about, I guess it was about three or four years ago. Yes. Now, it, and it takes a while to get things through. And maybe that's another thing you can take a look at is uh, expediting some of these, you know, rental developments. Well, given but, the, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. No, I'm glad you told me, I, I was guessing. Uh, so my question is, um, having worked with the people that are so desperately looking for this housing, does it make enough of a dent to make it worth it to do like maybe a step one right now where we do all the low hanging fruit and get those um, changed so that we can build uh, rentals above commercial? Or do you think we're better to wait for the long haul for the larger OCP amendment, which would be... You know. Well, I mean, there's an argument about supply. Yes, we realize that we do need more supply of rental, and it's what kind of what kind of rental, whether it is uh, below market, um, non-market, or, or uh, market housing. And uh, no matter what, it's just way too expensive here. For It's certainly too expensive for someone who is on a low income. Anyone who's making minimum wage can't afford unless there's two or three or four people in a one-bedroom apartment, it's still um, out of sight. Um, but what it does do, what I think it will do, and I think it's been proven that it will move people that are able to move up the housing continuum into this kind of rental housing to then open up more opportunities for people that are on lower incomes. Um, uh, that's why we have spoken in favor, what the, why the 
our PRC um, in the past has spoken in favor of, um, of market rental housing, but that's uh, that's the reason why. Um, uh, no, I think you know the answer for the the folks that I deal with doing homeless outreach and working with people that are on income assistance and PWD is non market housing, I, and I don't think there's you know there's there's no other way that we're going to get people to be able to afford anything. Like I said, minimum wage. I mean, uh, affordable housing on a minimum wage is seven fifty a month. Where can you find anything for seven fifty yeah. a month? Um, so this is this is not the answer for the folks that I deal with. However, it may move people up the housing continuum. And I say just get that rental out there. Get it out there. And expedite it if you possibly can. And if you can make it rental tenure, it will be rental tenure in perpetuity, which over time is going to bring prices down. The other thing that this does is that it upzones something that was commercial and it upzones it into residential. So there's there's extra money there that whoever has that property can then use to help to subsidize or to get a, a higher mortgage on the housing that they're creating. So there are options there, and and if, if the price is right, there may be a nonprofit or something that could you know take on. Thing at one at a time. I mean, they can't take on a whole building, but they might be able to take on a little corner, right? Every bit yeah. helps. Yeah, yeah. So I, I I think there's some options here, and I'd I'd look to staff to do some more investigation in, into this. And you know, I like the 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 uh, the angle that the, that they're looking at is you know this we can do, this is this is doable, and there's some more things to, that could be looked at in the city core. So I I I'd really urge you to. Uh, um, to if you've if you've got to um, print the resolution up a little bit or whatever you have to do, but just make it happen. I, I think this is a this is a good thing to do. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, <clears throat> Carol, that's your resolution. Um, yeah. You know, we are going to um, refer this to staff to come back with uh, further information on it. So, and a method of implementation. Okay, so rather than oh, just... Well, put it on the floor. Can we... You move it. It's your motion. Yeah, so the, the motion was to require 100% residential rental units over existing single-story commercial buildings upon so redevelopment. I'll just second that to put yeah. it on the floor. Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would like to have a you know real worthwhile conversation and hear what the other councillors have to say because uh, you know I'm not uh, a developer by any far stretches of the imagination, and I think there's enough wisdom on council that we could potentially make this even better. This was just my idea sitting no, around. It's, no, it's, it's fine. It's good. Uh, it would be my suggestion, and staff, uh, Mr. Ursick, let me know if um, it would be my suggestion we refer this to staff uh, as a quick referral. Uh, this is something uh, to be looked at in the long run with the OCP, but in the short run, uh, to have a response back maybe within a couple weeks um, in that staff tonight already identified some properties which we didn't have before this meeting, and there's probably more um, uh, to be brought back, um, like I said, a quick referral as opposed to uh, um, on it, and um, we're looking at inside the city center and um, um, outside the city center, and that actually dovetails with the motion that I'm gonna be put on the floor in the next, um, after this. So uh, I'll listen to other members of council um, uh, that want to on it, but I think uh, uh, we can uh, we can uh, move this along. And w m more importantly, what are the impacts? And obviously, um, we need to look at where it is, how high are we going to go? Okay. And one in it comes back to the package that they asked for months ago. What incentives are we giving to get what we want? And uh, Everybody throws out the word density. Um, well, that's not the only thing I think we got to look at. We've also got to look at quality of life and livability and everything else and where they are, and it's not just density, okay? It's uh, what size of units are we talking about? I heard somebody, uh, for example, in Richmond this afternoon bidding f almost half a million dollars for 535 square feet for two people. Can't get in there. So I just throw that out. Okay, so any of that, it's moved and seconded um, with the, uh, as a referral back to staff with 
the comments, and if there are other comments, let's come from committee to add anything else you might want. Alexa? Um, thank you. I have a couple questions with staff. So All right, staff. Um, and, and, you know, I, I love the idea of this, of course. Um, it, it does make me think of some things, like, you know, when I think of Danny's screamers at Francis and Garden City, it was owner-operated, and they lived above it. So, um, you know, I'd love to see an option for owner-operators who are living and working in the same spot. If you're trying to start your business and you need somewhere to live with your family and trying to run your business 24 hours a day, I think it'd be nice to live there. So, you know, I think having some options within that, because, and now we aren't actually adding density in this referral, is that correct? We're just, referrals just simply saying, we yes, but say want it to be residential. Can anybody answer that? It implies that we're adding Pretty density. Chair. My apologies, Mr. Chair. Uh, we didn't have councilors' mics on for that. Oh, oh sorry. All right, we'll start again. Okay. <laughs> sure. uh, it's, it's, it's actually, through the chair to council, through the chair, I did, I did uh, hear most of that. I think I got the gist of the question just regarding density, and you were uh, indicating, Councilor Lou, uh, Danny's or uh, Danny's um, the Screamers uh, Corner Store. It, it, the the um, the motion doesn't certainly doesn't talk about the maximum densities and any application that would even take advantage of this uh, uh, interim policy would have to go through a, uh, a rezoning application. So through that, it would be a negotiated process where we'd be discussing density and what's appropriate, and not appropriate. And there would be also uh, neighborhood consultation as well. So there would be all that process to, to work out through that, uh, through those details. Okay. Um, but does just even getting into this whole concept, um, at least it maybe sends a message out to the community that we're well and happy to entertain the concept of people putting some um, uh, residential rental on top of their existing commercial buildings. Is that the message that then comes out? Just like we sort of had the policies before that said, you know, you have to replace rental with rental, um, you have to help relocate people, whatever else. Like, so now that we have it in policy, it's much easier, but once it's kind of out there, then it's easier for the public to figure yeah, out what we're doing. Through the Chair to Council Lou, yeah, in many ways, we're already doing this through uh, discussions and inquiries on, on these type of properties, but I guess what this will do is send a stronger message uh, to um, to anyone who's interested in redeveloping these sites, uh, what, their, what the potential is. And through an interim policy, we can then also work on developing a stronger OCP policy that would uh, get into all the details that um, many of you are asking. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy? Uh, thanks, and through the chair. Uh, well, I support the referral. I, I think, um, first of all, the delegates, uh, thanks very much for coming forward. Some very good comments uh, from you as well. And, I mean, there's a lot of issues here. Uh, supply has been mentioned. The housing continuum has been mentioned, and, and those are all true. I like the comment, actually, about uh, this concept helping people move up through the housing continuum, and thereby, I think what was meant was opening up the rental market more and hopefully increasing... Um, vacancy rates, uh, both by increasing supply, but also by helping people move up. So um, like the mosaic uh, building at Three Road and Williams, I, I think that looks fantastic. And I think the idea of the gentle density um, in that neighborhood, uh, that seems to fit in uh, from what I can see. I don't know what the consultation was like, but um, I mean, I remember when it was a gas station because it was one of my first jobs, but I think that's a vast improvement uh, for that location is, uh, the mosaic building. So I think part of the conversation too that I'd, I'd be looking from from staff is how to really incentivize it as well. I mean, it's well and good to say this is what we want, but then you have to get people, um, uh, owners and builders on board with various incentives to actually make it happen. So I'm all for sending a message that this is what we'd like to see. And I'd like to see what further incentives we can do as a city to actually make it happen. So I, I'm happy to support it. I think it's a good idea. And um, I think there'd be, there'd be widespread support for it too if it's done in a thoughtful, well-planned out way. Uh, and I think that can be done. And I think the building at Three and Williams is a good example of that from everything I know. So thank you. Harold, you're, oh, you're not muted anymore. 
I'm on. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to uh, agree with uh, Andy on his late last statement. It has to be well thought out. Uh, I mentioned uh, last week of how we tried to uh, increase the uh, height of buildings on the streets from waterfront. We were going to get an acre of waterfront park, and uh, and Billy Harlow stood out there on the dike and collected hundreds of uh, thousands of six signatures against it, and we all ran for cover. I went through my records last night on others. I mentioned uh, Blundell where we tried it, and, and I thought I voted for the housing development. I ran for cover on that one, too. And reading the reports on it, people were screaming and hollering at us as what we're doing, raising raising the density and the height of the buildings. And so we backed down. So what I'd like to suggest is where it doesn't require a, a, a an official community plan amendment, yes, make those changes and, and requirements. But if it requires a, an, an OCP amendment, don't go for a single uh, OCP amendment by, location by location. Do it when you do the whole community plan, because you'll get the, the residents coming out when you discuss the whole community plan that say we've got a housing problem. But if you go to a spot like, well, say at, uh, at Steveston Highway and, and Number One Road and say, hey, we're going to give higher density, you, you might get the whole neighborhood out uh, uh, screaming and yelling, yelling at you like they did at Blundell, or if you tried it again at Blundell. But when you deal with a whole community plan, you get a much more reasoned discussion and reasoned de debate. And so I, I'm not going to be here when all this happens, but I would suggest that the, that if there's OCP amendments to be made, that it be done uh, done reasonably and carefully as a package, not just on a on a spot spot uh, changes to the OCP. Too many times we've done that, and and uh, it hasn't worked. Okay, thanks, Harold. Jack. Yes, I just want to follow up on the, uh, what uh, Harris has mentioned. Well, I, I just came back from Regina, and I took time. Uh, to walk in the uh, city center area. And there were blocks and blocks and blocks of rental uh, condos in, in, in that city. So, and I remember that uh, many years ago in Richmond, we also have something like that, but this is disappearing. So I believe what we have right now in front of us is uh, a step forward, but uh, it's not enough to solve the problem. So I just want to echo what Harris has mentioned, I think when we, to the uh, overall review of OCP, I think we need to have much bolder changes uh, in, in, in the plan. But this is the right step uh, uh, in, the, in the right direction. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, seeing uh, none, uh, motions on the floor to refer to staff. Let's go, all those in favor? Contrary carried, it's carried <clears throat> without dissension. Okay, the next item I put on the floor is similar, and I hope it, uh, I'll explain it. Um, and the, this is a referral to staff. And Arita, Harold, you don't have this. I'm, I apologize uh, for it. I thought we, we, I sent it to you, but, and, and it reads that the finance and the real estate departments examine the feasibility of the city of Richmond acquiring property through purchase for the sole purpose of partnering, including senior levels of government, comma, in order to build non-market housing, which includes cooperative housing. And I would put that in the floor. If I get a seconder, I'll second it. Uh, we've got to come at this housing issue from very different fronts. Harold and I will remember, it was probably 32 years ago the last cooperative was built in Richmond. And that would be down near his place, actually, about 1988. And we, we keep talking about market rental, whatever, and we aren't dealing. And the D brought up tonight about people moving up the continuum. And one of the things, uh, as sitting on the uh, BC Housing, or BC Housing, Metro Vancouver Housing Committee, where Richmond has 836 units down in Monado Village and what have you, where people start there and then move along the way as they progress. And we are, we as a city need to come at it from totally different fronts. And uh, I'm not sure where we would do this, whatever, but the city from time to time, we acquire land for parks. Um, we acquire land that we've given to nonprofits, Pathways, uh, Kiwanis, um, you know, stories are good examples, um, but we also could acquire 
um, uh, lots for non-market housing, and we don't have to do 65 lots or 85 lots. We could do 20. We could do 15. You could do nine, you know. Um, but uh, and I put cooperative housing in there, but co-ops work very well um, in, in our community, anyhow, from what I've seen and the people at uh, the one Gary Point Co-op, I believe, was built in 1984. People are extremely proud of it and what have you. So I, it's, um, and I've left in there uh, that if the seniors, other levels of government who talk a lot but don't really give any money, uh, come along and offer us incentives. Uh, Mr. Eby, are you listening? Um, uh, great. And um, uh, we're prepared to um, uh, purchase, um, hopefully, properties and uh, uh, make it happen. You know what we did up on Smith Road? And I, I support that 100% with BC Housing. But I think we've got to really think outside the box if we're going to continue to tackle this. Otherwise, we're going to stymied like many other areas. So. Anyhow, I put that on the floor. I'm moved and seconded, and hopefully I hear uh, comments from uh, everybody else and uh, some direction on that. Um, I'm not sure who was first. Harold, I'm going to go back to you. Okay. I, I certainly support the motion. It, it's, an, it's funny. I was just reading all these old reports last night, and, and that's another one I read way back in, I don't know, the 70s or 80s. Yeah. We had a fund. Uh, that we collected money from various sources and we put the money in a fund to buy land. I don't know if we still got the fund or not. We, uh, we, we may have a bank account somewhere with some money in it. Let's but, create uh, it. I think we need to create it if we don't. And I, I certainly support the motion. And maybe staff could look out and uh, look and see if we, I know we, when we had the, the Kiwanis building, we had some money there and the, uh, and stories. So uh, maybe that was, the, that's where the funding went, but it was there for co-ops and, and, uh, and affordable housing in particular. So if we haven't got it, let's let's recreate it. Thank you. Uh, Jack? Well, I support the motion. However, I think it's not going far enough. So if I may, I would like to, to add or amend the, the motion. Uh, so the motion uh, would, should be, would be uh, the uh, staff to, to examine the feasibility of the city of Richmond, A, acquiring property through purchase and B, using its land reserve for the sole purpose of partnering, including senior levels of government, blah, 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 blah. Because I think, yeah, the motion is good in the sense that, you know, we are looking into uh, buying land and to use it for um, uh, co-op housing. However, I think th this might take a long time. Uh, we have to f identify, identify the land and purchase it and find the money. But so I think at the same time, we also examine whether or not, or how much we can use the land we already have in our own hands, I and go into on. this this kind of a, uh, cooperative housing. Very often, uh, the senior levels of government will say, "Oh, we have the money, and then we want to 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 partner with the uh, municipal government, and we want them to use their own land, and then and then they would give us uh, the cities the the, the the grants and the funding." Now, I want them to to show it. You know, when we have the land, and we, if Richmond can tell them that, okay, this, we have this much land, and we are willing to use it for this kind of uh, affordable housing, how much money are you going to chip in? So that's why I would like to add a, a, a part B of, of this motion, well, so, you know, including the land that we already have. Well, I think that that uh, goes with staff to examine what yep. we already have and come back and add to whatever we have. Um, we did get a package not too long ago about all the lands we had, and uh, staff could look to see if there were properties worthwhile purchasing on the other side of what we already own. So it's, um, I think staff could take that under advisement, and we'll make that as a note. I appreciate the suggestion. Okay, thank you. All right, Carol? Much uh, through the chair, uh, just so you know, there is a UDI complimentary luncheon on June 9th, this Thursday, between 11.30 and 1.30 with Minister Eby and okay. Bob Rennie, and it's to discuss BC's housing needs. So if you want to ask the minister directly, that's a great opportunity. I unfortunately have econ, but I hope somebody from this committee can go. Yeah. Um, so my question to staff is um, we have a purchase policy right now. Uh, how does it look in comparison to what is being proposed 
on this motion. Uh, through the chair, we, we don't actually have folks from uh, the finance or real estate areas. We do have um, uh, we do have some existing properties. We actually have three properties that could be used for non-market housing. And uh, I think that if I understood it correctly, the the motion uh, was to examine additional funding for uh, additional acquisitions, which our finance people could do. I, I would say, though, that yeah. notwithstanding the claims that there's hundreds of millions or even billions of dollars available, when when uh, you know when you when the rubber hits the road, the senior funding is simply not there. There is insufficient funding. And so I'll use the example of the Sexsmith site. It's a site that's been there for quite a long time uh, as an affordable housing site, city-owned. And quite simply, the program that, that would fund development of that site for uh, below-market housing is oversubscribed at the provincial level, and there's just no funding. So, um, you know, I, I think that, of course, buying land is the starting point. But um, it's also going to require, I, I think, more dollars and less talk, frankly, yes. from senior government. Uh, just just um, when you talked, uh, we just did the Finance uh, Committee last night, and in the report it stated that we have $1.4 billion in cash and reserves. So I, I think there's money that can be spent. Um, so maybe planning can work with finance to see how much of that could actually be allocated. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I just remind people it, it is for the purpose of non-market, okay, and cooperative housing. Andy, wrap it up. Um, thank you, and through the chair. I'll, I'll support the motion because uh, I think it's uh, another part of the whole puzzle that we can look at, and I think it uh, can be partly strategic. It can be partly creative. I think um, I agree implied in this is that there'll be an, an examination not of just property to be purchased, but also... Um, city-owned property that could be put to another use, perhaps, or put to words this use. I think another part of it that would uh, be very worthwhile is looking at different stakeholders involved in this, not just funders, but partners, non-government organizations, you know, operators, that kind of thing, that are all part of the puzzle to make it work better. And um, I do want to just comment on, again, the issue of the city taking on greater responsibility in roles that maybe were... Um, more better, more done better in the past. And a couple of people have commented on it, Councillor Steves and Councillor McNulty. But the provincial and federal governments, uh, the last numbers I looked at, they are spending about a, or yeah, completing about a third of the housing starts in the last 20 years that they did in the kind of 1960s, 1970s, right. and through the 1980s. And uh, they talk about putting money into it, but there's uh, a lag that's been created. So there's a lot of work to be done. And they do have to come to the table with more money. And if we can help that to happen, then I think it's worth looking at. I think it could be part of the solution. Uh, I support the analysis of it and the feasibility of it. And uh, I think it could be a, a, a good thing to do. So uh, I support it wholeheartedly. Thank you. Alexa. Sorry, the mic wasn't on. Um, I know there's some groups that own land and the land isn't yet um, zoned for residential or those kind of things. And, you know, would they make sense for a co-op? Could, could we, would we consider it for a co-op? Does it make sense? And, you know, if they bundled with like a neighboring other piece of land or something else. So, um, you know, can, can we add that as a second as to are there existing large parcels that could be considered converting to large to co-op? Yeah, it's fine. Anything that's going to help us get get some uh, 
non-market housing at the other end. Yep. Good. You okay? Done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, perfect. Okay, Chuck, wrap it up. Well, I, and, no, I want to say that, uh, yes, you know, it seems like implicit that uh, we include the land that we already have. Yeah. But let's make it explicit so that uh, we, you know, be, it to the, to the, well, through, uh, pur through purchase and or examination of city's assets. Great, okay. okay. My, my, I also have a question. Uh, For the sole staff. purpose, though, of building non-market housing. Yes. You know, it's where I, that's the bottom line. Yes, yes. It's Good. not market housing or other. It's non-market and others. That's why I put right. So, yeah, for the purchase, uh, 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 for the purchase and, and other city assets. Yes. That'll take care of what you want. Good. Okay. And, and in conjunction to that, I want to ask staff to uh, give us some information. Yes, uh, we know that uh, the different levels of governments talk a, has talk a lot, right? And, uh, and from time to time, they say, oh, we throw this money, this much money into the, uh, the port for uh, more housing. Can staff provide us some analysis on the percentage of expense expenditure or in the budget of the provincial government, for example, on housings? See how what has been the increase in the in the in the, in the uh, expenditure on housing support in the provincial government's budget in the last ten years, five years. So I think that may show that how much talk they are doing and how much work they are actually put into supporting what they say. Can, do you think staff can provide us with something like that, some kind of a figures? Through the chair and councillor Al, yes, I, I think we can do that. We'll work with um, the folks in the finance department. I, another thing to consider is also that the the senior levels of government often limit where housing money can be spent. And so, for instance, uh, when I met with uh, MP Baines, mm -hmm. I made him aware that although the federal government had earmarked over three hundred million dollars for uh, housing uh, for BC, um, almost all of that money was through the Rapid Housing Fund and there were only four municipalities that were eligible for that funding. So effectively, all of the rest of us had to compete for $12 million, which is a drop, a drop in the bucket. Um, so uh, not only... Not only uh, you know, where we try to look at, well, how much is being spent and how does it compare? But I, I think we can also give you some information on how much we actually qualify to even compete for mm -hmm. uh, because there are often strings attached that exclude us yeah, as a great. community. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're good. Okay, seeing no further discussion then, I'll call a question on that. All those in favour? Contrary carried. Thank you very much. And... Uh, Good housing, as we'll say. Uh, managers' reports. Anything from managers? Yes, through the chair to member Good. of council. Uh, I have an update uh, regarding uh, the city staff will be submitting a response to the National Association for Industrial and Office Parks, NAOP. This is their annual cost of business survey. We'll be submitting it this week. The cost reported represent an increase over previous year's surveys in keeping with CPI adjustments and cost of increases provided uh, and cost of increases associated with the uh, construction cost value as reported by NAOP, which impact building permit fees. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Anybody okay. else? Suzanne? Uh, oh, uh, yes. Uh, through the chair? Yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Cooper, ladies first. Yeah. Oh, sorry. okay. Suzanne, you're on. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take my moment. Okay. Thank you. I'm here today uh, to advise Mayor and, or advise uh, committee that Mayor and Council will receive a memo later this week uh, to advise of the launch of the latest round of city snapshots on Let's Talk Richmond, which will start this coming Monday, June the 13th, and run three weeks until July 3rd. City snapshots, as you may recall, is our online information session on how the city is planning for growth and development. The purpose is to inform and engage the community and field questions and comments on the forum. Um, staff from Planning, Affordable Housing, Sustainability, and Transportation will be providing responses on the forum. There will be a press release uh, and other promotional activities, which will be used to boost awareness and participation. 
And finally, a memo summarizing participation and comments received will be circulated to Council in the weeks following its conclusion. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, James. <clears throat> okay, um, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, advise committee that uh, a very large tree has been uh, planted at 11560 Williams Road. Um, it's a sequoia. It's about nine meters high following a legal notice that we uh, had delivered uh, last year. Uh, staff will be following with details in a memo. Okay, thank you very much. Great. Any, any other members? Yeah, of, one, yes, go ahead. A quick, quick update, Mr. Uh, Chair. Uh, I'd like to actually introduce our new senior planner with the policy planning department, uh, Karen Montgomery. If I could ask you just to put your camera on. That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, uh, I'm pleased Karen. to say that I'm, I'm pleased to say that Karen actually will be working on our housing portfolio, amongst oh. other things. Uh, <laughs> we we actually Used stole her from the city the of North. Table here. <laughs> Absolutely, it's great news, and uh, we, we stole her from the city of North Vancouver, and uh, she's also worked in the UK for over ten years uh, in in housing. Uh, so we're happy to have her here, and uh, just wanted to make sure that you were aware. Good. Welcome again. Good to have you aboard. Anything else? Any other good news like that? <laughs> okay, seeing none, motion to adjourn. We're adjourn moved. Second, all those in favor, we are adjourned and we have an in camera momentarily. Thank you all. <clears throat>